high. This is what rage looks like. My very particularized, personalized version of hell would be me filming for three hours only to find out that my mic was not on. So if I sound a little fucking testy, call me balls. Anyway. <laughs> Hi, it's Kendall here. If you're new around here, welcome. If you're not new around here, what is up, home skillet biscuit? Happy Saturday. If you don't know what Saturday is, Saturday is when I do a little something on my, let me check my fucking mic. Saturday is when I do a little something on my channel called Bad Movies and a Beat, the series on my channel where I talk about bad movies while putting my makeup on, but obviously. A few things before we get started. One, I've never been more harassed than I have been when people have been hunting me down to ask where this wig is from. I will link it down below. Stop yelling at me. Y'all have followed me to every social media. <laughs> it is not sponsored. I bought it with my own money. It's from Hair Vivi uh, and I'll link that down below. And two, we have today's sponsor because bills, more specifically, taxes everybody wants to be an influencer until them taxes come around so yeah sending it over to ad roll kenny because <laughs> the pain i feel jesus hello there it's ad roll kenny to let you know that today's video is sponsored by glamnetic glamnetic makes comfortable secure and stylish magnetic lashes as well as magnetic liner to put the lashes on all you have to do is try out either their pen liners or their liquid personally i'm a liquid fan put that on like you would any other regular liner and then put the lashes on each set of lashes has six magnets on it so it allows you to have a full and secure um, attachment to the eye and it's really really great for beginners so that you don't have to mess with messy glue and you can do two makeup steps at the same time your lashes and liner come with two anchor lashes on each lash personally i think it lasts just fine without them but if you want to for extra security you can put them up under your lashes for a little extra oomph, a little anchor they come in like a billion different styles and each pair lasts for about 60 wears so they last way longer than your traditional lash and there are vegan lashes available and all lashes are cruelty free. The ones I'm wearing right now are Vixen. They're big, but they're not too overbearing. They're more long than super full, but I like it when I'm wearing just like a thinner liner. But if I would like to switch out my lashes really quickly, all I'd have to do is just pick them up. I could just take those off and then put them in the magnetic case like that. These ones are called Venus. They're like really pretty. And then you can just pop them on. Go in with some tweezers if you need to, to just get a precise application. You don't have to worry about messy glue. There's no real drying time. And then I like to go in with the Glamnetic pen liner so that the line is smooth. And you are set, baby. You can't really see them because they're like a shorter lash. Every day, really pretty. Well, check out Glamnetic with the link down below. Use my code so that you can get some money off. Also, Glamnetic offers Zip, which makes it easy to shop for your lashes now and pay over time. Big thanks again to Glamnetic for sponsoring today's video. Now let's get on to the debauchery. These lemon bitches are a very underrated Girl Scout cookie. These and tagalongs. I will not let people gaslight me into liking Samoas. Those are gross. A little tart tart, love it. So last week we watched Bound 2015, not to be confused with the 90s one, which apparently is a decent movie. People were telling me that in the comment section, but it's not that. This is not, this is not a good movie. This Bound is uh, basically another of those kind of store brand, 50 Shades of Grey <laughs> type movies that came out around that time. But one component that I actually appreciate about the movie is that they decided romance is really creepy when you think about it. Let's just make it a thriller, which I love. I, I think that they, <laughs> I think more romance should just do that. Like I appreciate that instead of like romanticizing all the serial killery things that happened from any media that came from Twilight essentially, well romance in general, but they said, no, this is weird. Let's turn it into a thriller. And I kind of appreciate that. But if you want to check out that video, that'll be linked up above, or you can check it out in the Bat Movies in a Beat playlist. Now, the day is finally upon us. It's a very full circle moment. Today we're feeling a little nostalgic because we're gonna be referencing my first ever Bad Movies in a Beat back in 2019 because that video was on Tall Girl. For those of you that has never seen that movie, I decided to make a video uh, calling it stupid because for those of you that don't know, I I'm a real life tall girl, six foot tall. Actually, not the six foot tall asterisk that men on dating apps be saying. I am six foot tall before shoes and not including a very high haircut. No shade, just saying I have looked down at many a man who said they were six two. But in that video, all I really said was this movie is 
fucking stupid. The first movie was really focused on like how her being a six foot one woman made her doomed to a life of solitude, pariahdom, and celibacy. And um, and as a six foot tall woman, I was like, what? <laughs> Very few things in my life have been hindered by being tall. Um, most of which just have to do with like pants, to be quite frank with you. And I guess to some degree it has an effect on my dating life, but if anything, I think of it more as like a way to weed out people. As a heterosexual woman, if I meet a man and he's really hung up on the fact that he's shorter than me, I just, I just don't date that man. <laughs> like it's very easy. Like if you're 5'10 and we meet and it bothers you that you're shorter than me, then we're not gonna work. What am I gonna do? What am I supposed, what do you want me to do for you, hon? Get you stilts? So you feel like a man? You want me to chop my knees off so that I can appeal to the patriarch? Like, what am I supposed to <laughs> But the first tall girl created this scenario that would not exist in which this woman who is six one, maybe slightly taller than the rest of her peers. Again, she's in high school. Like nobody plays basketball, nobody plays volleyball. Even if that's the case, she wouldn't be significantly taller than everybody else. And even if she was, that probably wouldn't have a big effect on her social life. The thing that frustrated me is that because it was focused towards a younger viewership, I was watching it like, this would make me feel like shit. <laughs> like it created all of these scenarios just to say, you don't have to worry about these scenarios in your life, be who you are. And it's like, I didn't have these issues in real life. You got me thinking a new shit I need to be concerned about. <laughs> and then two, it was incredibly not self-aware. The movie made it seem like this pretty, thin, wealthy white girl will be the most ostracized person in this school because she's slightly taller than everybody else. And it's just like, again, creating a scenario that did not exist and also just being very like obtuse. There was something morbidly funny about the meme where people would stitch the, you think your life is hard? I wear a 13 men's shoe. And people would stitch it like, I have cancer. <laughs> Shut up. <laughs> and so fast forward to a few months ago and people were like, Kendall, did you know they're making a second one? And about what, did she get taller? Like they accepted her at the end of the first movie at six one, but if she, you know, went up to six one and three fourths, like we back to square one again, I don't know. Where no, actually this movie has a lot less to do about her being tall, which is good. And more has to do with her uh, self doubt and just general um, anxiety and how that ultimately all comes to a head as she's trying to attempt to do new things, particularly be the lead in a play, uh, a musical called Bye Bye Birdie. And though I know many of you are waiting for me to roast this film, you know, slam it for its Netflix sequel cliches, which I will. There are some things that are very like cliche at this point for for Netflix movies. You know, the more attractive, vaguely ethnic, racially ambiguous new guy that makes the lead question uh, the original relationship only to leave it even though it was a better relationship for the boring white dude that she was dating in the first movie. We're, we're gonna have all of that. I know that a lot of people are expecting me to like rip into this movie, like tear it a new asshole. I just, I don't really feel particularly impassioned about this movie one way or another. Do I think it's a masterpiece of cinema? No, but in fairness, it was never really claiming to be either. Also, I'm very well in my 20s. I am not the prime demographic for this movie. So like, am I upset that it's childish and corny? No. But with that said, I think it's cute. I think the subject matter that it tries to tackle is a lot more appropriate because instead of having to make up issues to solve them, it actually tackles things that people actually deal with, like anxiety and like having self doubt. And I think that's a much more important conversation to have for the demographic they're aiming for, as opposed to this like, instead of this like delusional like, oppression Olympic she's doing within herself because she's a tall woman, like shut the f up. But I feel like this movie handles those topics in a pretty age appropriate way. And you know, I'm not mad at it. If you're going into a teen corny romantic comedy, then that's what you're gonna get. And if you want it to be like peak cinema, why are you watching Tall Girl 2? <laughs> so yeah, for all intents and purposes, I guess I'm sitting here to defend it. A very lukewarm defense of Tall Girl 2, 2022. So since it's been a while, I guess we do have to do the whole recap and they do a bit of that in the beginning of the movie. Um, the movie centers around Jody, who's the tall girl. She was bullied for being tall, social pariah, yada, yada, yada. She had a best friend named Dunkelman, who was a short guy who had a crush on her since they were little kids. But she decided that she didn't want him. She wanted the new 
Swedish exchange student. That is so difficult to say. Swedish exchange student Stig, which I've been made aware that apparently Stig is a very old name, <laughs> like a name that no young Swedish person is named. It's like naming a 20 year old Maud. It's like having a child pop out the coochie with bifocals. Jody had a crush on him just because he's tall. Been there, honey. Again, it's just one less thing to think about. One less stupid conversation I have to have. Like, you sure you okay with me being four inches shorter than you, Kendall? I was before we were having this conversation. I feel like I'm coming off like a real bitch in that comment. Let me explain again, cause I've said this in other videos, but just in case you're newer. My issue with shorter men is not that they're shorter. My issue with shorter men is that they tend to feel like they have to exert themselves because people undermine them for being short via the rules of patriarchy, present themselves as more masculine. So they end up just being dickheads, like super dickheads. <laughs> so when a dude kind of insinuates that it's something that is on his mind regularly, it's just like, oh, I don't feel like being your way to prove your manhood. Like shit, the short ones love you when you're tall, man. It's like something they can conquer, like a elk they can take down. And it's just like, leave me alone, you fucking dung beetle. Like anyway, sorry. <laughs> so she liked him because he was tall and they did a little dating or whatever. Um, but then it fell apart because he ended up humiliating her. I don't remember the specifics. This is what they told us in the beginning of uh, Tall Girl 2, I don't know. She has a bully named Kimmy, uh, who's still a bitch. Uh, she has a best friend who now has a name. I don't recall her having a name in the first movie. Her name is Farida, black girl with the cool hair and the nice fashion, real quirky, loved her. Um, but her whole purpose in the first movie was to be the, you can do it white woman, sideline cheerleader that all black characters tend to be in these movies. But I will say they gave her more of like a personhood in this movie. So again, I think they were listening to criticisms. Jodi learns to love herself. She does a whole speech about how she loves herself at homecoming, even though she was dressed in that hideous fucking outfit. If there's ever been such a thing as tall phobia, it is that fucking outfit hideous. Y'all can find any other fabric to put her in. She came in with stripper heels, a pompadour, a poet neck, and a prince blue suede suit or velour. If you don't like the bitch, just say that. She do her whole speech about, I'm okay with being tall. I love who I am. No, you don't, you wore that. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, again, I'm filming this again. So I'm a little bit more saucy. And maybe I like to tussle. <laughs> they get together, the end of the movie, yay. She loves herself, cool. Uh, and they get together. So this movie begins three months after that happened. And um, they've been together for three months, yay. And she's no longer ostracized for being tall. Like everyone thinks, whoa, you're popular now. Go Jody. you set us straight at homecoming with that ugly outfit and that <laughs> they would still bully her. Hold on, stop. You want me to believe the bullying stopped after she wore that outfit and gave a speech? Sorry. Cecil. Um, anyway, people aren't, judging her for being tall anymore, yay. Quite the opposite now, she's like incredibly popular. Basically, uh, it's announced that the school will be doing Bye Bye Birdie, which apparently is like a musical that she really, really loves and she's always wanted to play in. And so she's hyping herself up for that. So they start auditions for Bye Bye Birdie and Jody is waiting in line. That is where we meet the love triangle, the new love interest, the rival, the racially ambiguous guy with a really strong jaw. Uh, this time he's Dominican, his name is Tommy. But rooting hot 25. Can I do like a Christina Aguilar? But rooting hot 25 year old teenager. <laughs> they really need to let him grow some facial hair, but I know why they don't because he's supposed to be playing 17, but that looks like a grown man and, um. That is the that is a mid 20s jaw if I've ever seen one. Somebody let him play his age. I wanna see him hairy. He flirts with her, lets her know that he really resonated with her like I believe in myself speech that was at homecoming a few months prior. So much so that he can kind of like recite it. During the audition, you can tell that um, the writer of the movie decided to kind of address some of the issues that were brought in the first movie very like overtly, which was fun. Uh, because during the audition, the drama teacher basically says like, hey, we saw your speech, blah, blah, blah. And what would you say to people who don't think that being tall is a real problem? It was a little too on the nose. It cracked me up. It was very, it was bad. That that scene just was, ugh. The lack of subtlety was just hilarious to me and very cringy. Uh, being homeless, not knowing where your next meal is coming from. Those are real problems. Well, I'm not saying that being tall is worse than any of those things. It's just, 
Sometimes it feels like it is, but I know that it's not. It doesn't make all the bad things that have happened to me every day my entire life any less real. Like, sure, it's not as bad as being homeless or food insecure or, or a minority, but you know, my hurt still, <laughs> my hurt is still hurt, you know? Like none of the things that she goes on about, like her struggles, as a tall woman have ever happened to me at least. And I know a lot of tall women. I was birthed from a tall woman who gave birth to another tall woman, who comes from a family of tall women, who who sent me to a school with other tall women. This shit don't happen. Like there's a scene soon after this where her and, and the boyfriend are going to get ice cream and the guy behind them is like, says in disdain, like how tall are you? 6'2", 6'3". And it's like, that's literally never, happen to me like because like my conversations with strangers about my height really you want to know what it is how tall are you uh six foot really six foot that's so cool thanks sometimes i get congratulated you know as if i've run the like genetic raffle <laughs> but for the most part that's the end of the conversation it's like oh that's cool anyway like you continue fucking having conversation like it's not <laughs> and also it's not something that comes up regularly with people that i already know like, this is a conversation we have once while meeting and then never again after this. Like it never, it very rarely comes up. Yeah, though this movie does have like instances to like remind us that her life is shaped by her height. Uh, it doesn't focus as much on it and, and that's all I can really ask for. It, it'd be odd for them to call it tall girl too and they never referenced her height at all, I guess, because that's why it was a stupid concept in the first place. Our main B plot, I say with hesitation because there's a lot of subplots in this movie. It's awful. It's very jumbled and it's a lot. So like retelling it is very annoying. I will warn you, I'm going to skip most of them. The only subplot I care about is Farida, uh, the black friend who will end up having like an enemies to lover thing with the Swedish guy. And not just that, She's also gonna have like a follow your dreams thing too. She's gonna become like, she's gonna start trying to be a fashion designer, which is kind of cool. Like I said before, there's a lot of subplots in this movie, none of which I feel like going down because it would be very confusing, honestly, to follow them all. So I'm just gonna do a quick read. Kimmy, the bully and her black friend stop being friends because she is mean and doesn't do anything for anybody but herself. He also has a crush on Jody because everyone does now. <laughs> uh, Jody's sister gets a job in LA and that, uh, is hard for her because she's a support system. Also, Stieg has a sister who comes in from Sweden and she is completely irrelevant. She did not need to be in the movie at all. So those are the subplots I don't care about, except for the black girl and her love life because I'm happy that she's allowed to have one. Back to the main story though. Tommy is playing opposite Jody. We didn't see that coming in the play and they actually have chemistry, but they're rehearsing and the whole time her nerves are getting to her and she's like, wow, I don't think I can do this. And that's the beginning of her like self doubt conversations to herself and it really starts to psych her out and also because kimmy is kind of antagonizing her like you're gonna fail you're gonna do shitty on stage her nerves are getting to her to such an extent that it ends up actually leaking into a three-month anniversary dinner that she was doing with her boyfriend and so noticing that she's having a tough time dunkelman is like hey if you need to focus on the play, study your lines, really devote to it, and you can't really be here right now. I completely understand. I wanna support you, do that. And so she says, thanks, and gets up ready to leave. And then he get mad. If you ever wanna have a funny ass time, <laughs> act accordingly to a man's words. That shit is funny. I don't deserve you. You deserve so much better than me. Damn, thanks for letting me know. I was about to slum it. She about to leave and he like, why would you do that? And it ends up starting this whole like argument that eventually leads in them breaking up. That gives space for Jody and Tommy to get closer for their relationship to blossom a bitch. Um, he explains that he resonates with her whole story about learning to love yourself. In her case, her height. In his case, he was chubby. So he like had a lot of insecurities around body image because of that. You know, he was teased and bullied because of that. She says something along the lines of like, whenever I go to a movie theater, someone throws popcorn at my head because I'm so tall. And it's like, that does not happen. Like it doesn't, like I'm getting frustrated again. I told my, it's better than the first one, but still it's like it, the fat kid, odds are, did suffer from a lot of bullying as a kid. Maybe I've lived a privileged life. I've not been bullied for my height when it's just been happening all over the place, I guess. I don't know. But it's just like that 
never happen. <laughs> they commiserate, they kiss. And I get sad because I know it's not gonna go anywhere. But after the kiss, Jody, who's still trying to like have a civil relationship with her ex, feels like it's most appropriate to tell him that she kissed somebody else before he hears it from somebody else. So, so she sits him down and she's like, yeah, I kissed Tommy. And he is pissed. He throws all his stuff away that they had together, deletes photos and videos of them together. He's like, I've spent all my life obsessing over Jody. Let me get a hobby. So he takes up photography. And Tommy and Jody still have some chemistry, but she decides that she's too hung up on that little dung beetle so she can do. Like she's trying to move on. She's trying to burn them ugly ass shoes that he gave her, but she was like, I can't do it. So she tries to get it out the fire and then Kimmy uh, helps her because she woke up one day and decided to be a good person all of a sudden. Farida and Stieg kiss. And then she feels bad about it. Cause she's like, oh my God, girl code, man. Um, but then when they tell Jody, she's like, this is, so okay. It's one of the only okay things that have been happening because she has anxiety. So side note, this is probably an unpopular opinion, but I don't really agree with the hard and fast universal girl code rule. I, I think there's a lot of situations where it's not the best idea to date your friend's ex. Uh, one, if there's kids, you guys have a messy relationship, like you're on again, off again, stuff like that. You know, if you don't have any feeling for your ex, you don't have kids, there's not like a messiness involved with your interactions with this ex, I don't see why there's anything wrong with your friend dating them. If there's nothing entangling you to that person anymore, why not? Yeah, and if your friend is like, hey, I wanted to let you know that I have feelings for this person, I don't see why there's anything wrong with that. I don't think that's unreasonable to me at all. But some people are still very like, that's my ex, so it's off limits. And it's like, it depends. <laughs> it depends on what your relationship is or isn't with this ex, in my opinion. But that's just my my little thoughts on it. So throughout the movie, I, I forgot to mention this, uh, Jody's been having like anxiety attacks, thoughts of doubt, uh, you know, this play, she's gonna fuck up the play. Um, she has another panic attack right before the show and Kimmy of all people goes into like, calm her down and it's like, you can do this, you got this, don't let those voices in your head tell you, you don't got this, blah, 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 blah. And after seeing this, the black friend that used to be friends with Kimmy, they make up, they do the show and it goes well. There's only one part where she starts to forget her lines and then Kimmy on the outside gives her a heads up of what the lines were. And she was able to go through it smoothly. And at the end, when she's backstage and she still hears those voices that are saying like, you are bad, you're not good. She's able to reaffirm herself and to let her know that she's capable and that she did a great job. And uh, the movie basically wraps up with her and Dunkelman getting back together. They celebrate the um, play. Farida is possibly gonna go to Sweden for her senior year to be with Stieg. And that's the movie. If we're comparing the two movies, it's sizably better than the first one. It still has a lot of that like, oh, the things that happen because I'm tall. But for the most part, it, it's about things that actually matter. Topical, I guess, to, to do a conversation around like anxiety and mental health as opposed to her her tallness, but wasn't the complaint last time that we were talking about things that weren't actually an issue. And now we are, we're talking about like mental health. So I'm okay with it. I think they handled it in an age appropriate way. Uh, I don't think it was overly complex than the, like the demographic that would be watching this movie. I don't think it would make me feel like shit for having anxiety too. Again, my issue before it, like I didn't even feel bad about being tall. And I was like, if I was a kid, I'd be sad now. So yeah. It's a movie, you can watch it if you want. And again, in a very like full circle moment, uh, we're back at, at Tall Girl, which does make me feel a bit sentimental actually, as I sit here. It's been over two years we've been doing this series, almost three, and it's just grown. And it's so great to have you guys along for the ride, especially those of you that are here like every week. Oh, this is like a part of my weekend ritual and stuff, which I just, I just love so much. Anyway, if you like this video, feel free to like this video. Follow me on all my social media, Instagram, Twitter, both of which are Kenny JD. And I will see you guys next time.